Hi, I'm Alex Cunningham. I'm a USDA PPQ identifier at the Port of Miami, and I specialize in macrolepidoptera, especially neotropical noctuity. This is a simplified key for taking larvae, usually to the family level. And this key should be particularly useful for insects encountered at United States ports of entry. But since it is a family key, it should be good for North American and other larvae from all over the world. Because of the way that the key is set up, I just want to mention that there will be some couplets that lead to microlepidoptera. And when that's the case, those will be in gray. And that would mean then would be the time to go to one of the other keys from this workshop or another uh, microlepidoptera key as appropriate. I just want to first emphasize the word macrolepidoptera here. We don't use that term as often as the word microlepidoptera. Oftentimes it seems that people talk about lepidoptera and then microlepidoptera. So macro would just mean everything else. So if this is somebody with interest in micros, you are at the wrong presentation. All right, this is a general overview of a lepidoptera larva. Particularly, I just want to note that the head is to the left. In the rest of this presentation, whenever you see a close-up of a particular insect, uh, the head will be to the left unless that is otherwise specified. And this is just a review of some of the uh, characters that are covered in the morphology portion. But this is just a good general image from LEP Intercept that you can use as a reference at any time. So let's just get right into the key here. I'm going to read through each of the couplets in number. So of course, as you're keying something out, you may be jumping to another portion. But this is really just to explain the key generally, and then also show you uh, what each of these characters look like in many cases. So our first couplet talks about the vestiture of the insect. Body with numerous secondary CD or scoli, hiding most of the primary CD, or one prime is body without numerous short secondary CD or scoli, and primary CD evident. Now here I have two examples that both have secondary CD. So these can be very long, or they can be very short. At a distance, that period looks almost velvety. But of course, under magnification, you'll see that it would have more than the simple primary CD. Without numerous short secondary CD or scoli, only the primary CD will be evident. In the top specimen, the noctuoid, you see large panaculae, and those CD are very easily seen. In the geometrid, below that, those would only be seen under magnification. But again, these are not covered with a vestiture. Couplet two talks about the shape of the head. So head usually much larger than the prothorax, body widest at the middle, lenticles present, crochets biordinal or triordinal in a laterally elongated circle. So the two things that really stand out here in these images are the shape of the head and the constriction behind it, and then this very characteristic crochet arrangement. And those are the Hesperiids. If you look at a more mature Hesperiid uh, from above, you'll often see, as this couplet describes, that it is expanding in the middle. It'll be widest in the center. So those are usually very easy to key out very quickly. Two prime reads that the head would be equal to the diameter of the prothorax or much smaller, sometimes retracted and hidden, body sometimes slug-like, lenticles usually absent, and crochets in a meso series. In other words, not the above. There will be sometimes some constriction behind the head capsules of other uh, larvae, but it won't be as obvious as that Hesperiid. And another easy group to rule out are the sphingids. Body with six to eight annulets per segment, and A8 often has a dorsal horn or a button, which is why these are often called the hornworms. In the case of the specimen at the bottom there, you see obviously where a horn would have been. So they don't always have this. I didn't describe what annulets are, but it's almost as if they have these segments within the segment. So these aren't simply just wrinkles. You'll see six to eight annulets per segment in the sphingids. So the alternative there would be the body lacks annulets or has no more than six if present. 
and that a dorsal horn would not be present on A8 or a spot like that button which indicated a horn. There sometimes are sphingids that have a horn only at earlier or later stages. In other words, it's another couplet that says everything else. Couplet four talks about the uh, position of the head. So head sometimes retracted and hidden, as in this image, body slug-like, or as in the case of most Lepidoptera larvae, head obvious from above and the body would be cylindrical. Head retracted and hidden now in couplet five, larva with spiny scoli, hairy tubercles or verruci, and rarely with gelatinous tubercles and crochets absent which I underlined because that is very important. So if you have the slug-like larva with a retracted head and it is spiny, or if it stings you, it's often the family Limacodidae. And this couplet goes directly to two families. So if the head is retracted and hidden, but the crochets are in a meso series interrupted at the center by a spatulate lobe, it's a Lysenid. And I don't have an image of that, but there is very clearly inserted into the middle of the crochet arrangement on the prolag, a lobe shaped just like a spatula. And here at the left, we have a sort of typical, although discolored, uh, slug-like lysenid larva. Couplet six separates out the papillionids. Papillionidae are notable because they have an osmeterium present, and the metathorax may be enlarged, they may have transverse body stripes and or an eye spot, and some have fleshy filaments, as you see in the center here. The osmeterium is only everted when the organism is uh, alarmed or in a defensive way, so this is something you'll want to look for a slit there behind the head, especially if you do have the enlarged uh, prothorax as is pictured at right there. Six prime then is that the osmeterium is absent and the prothorax and coloration are not as above. So again, everything else. On to seven. The abdominal segments two through six are divided into five or usually six annulets. Again, annulets like the sphingids. Crochets are in a continuous, usually triordinal meso series, sometimes with an extra short series of crochets parallel to the larger band. This is the Pierity. Now these also have a rather characteristic appearance, but by the time you get to this couplet, everything except Pierids should have been ruled out. Abdominal segments two through six not divided into annulets, which we won't see again in this key. And then the crochets uh, lacking that extra short series of crochets parallel to the larger band takes us to couplet eight. Here again is the uh, Pierid to repeat the beginning of this couplet and they're less obvious in this large specimen but you see these lines here showing those individual annulets. All right now something very characteristic we're going to take this one out to a subfamily many of you still are familiar with this being a family but these mid-dorsal glands on A6 and A7 separate out the Lymantriines. So the gypsy moth is here. And here are those very characteristic glands. Basically, if it looks like an Arctiine but has these glands, this is an Arabid in the subfamily Lymantriini. Without those glands on A6 and A7, we move on, which takes us to Another group of the Arabids, the Arctiani. Larvae with barbed secondary CD and heteroideous crochets. If the crochets, however, are homoideous, then the mandible has a large molar lobe. As you can see here, it would be on a microscopic level that we would see the secondary CD being barbed, but these Arctiines or tiger moths are often your classic woolly or fuzzy caterpillars. The alternative there for nine prime would be the secondary CD are not barbed, crochets are homoideous, and the large molar lobe is absent. If you've come this far and there are no scoli, that is one of our first lumping in this key of various odds and ends or unusual families. Now one of the 
very distinctive families, though, that keys out here is when you do have scoli, and they can be simple, as is pictured on the left of this younger larva, or branched, as they are on the right. And this separates out two important groups. First, another group of butterflies. Stemata not uniform in size or location. The head is angulate, sometimes with long scoli, scoli on the head. That's something you will not see in other groups. But see, here is this angulate face pointing down. It's not as obvious on the other. And there are scoli coming off of the head, OK? The mid-dorsal scoli are sometimes present on A7, but not on A9. And the last abdominal segment may be forked, as you see at the left. This could be mistaken for a Hesperiid in that it is widening here in the center, and that there is a bit of a, that it constricts. But this is not the head itself that is constricted. Not all of these are uh, unique uh, individual exceptions, but this does show very well that characteristic forked last segment. Also, distinctively, the crochets will be unordinal to triordinal, but are usually triordinal. Another very characteristic group, the giant silkworm moths. So if the stomata are uniform in size and location, the head is smooth, lacking scoli. The mid-dorsal scoli are sometimes present on A9, but not A7. And the last abdominal segment is never forked, and crochets are biordinal that is a Saturniid. Another big group that we're going to lump together and not cover in this key are caterpillars living in a tent or a case of plant or animal material. All right? So we're going to separate out the macros that are not living in a tent or case of plant or animal material. But before we move on, it's important to note a tent does not equal any kind of webbing on a leaf. And there, is a lot, there are a lot of different kinds of webbing that are, uh, different larvae make on leaves that are, may or may not have anything to do with pupation. If there is a specific case that is woven by the larva you're trying to identify, identify, make sure you hold on to that. That could be every bit as important as the larva. Now another group is going to be singled out here or, or set aside, and those would be the leaf miners. So, if you're still with us, you have an organism that is not living in a leaf mine. Now here's the first time we separate out a group that would only be Microlepidoptera, but now we're going to look at A6. So here we have numbered the abdominal segments, starting after the forelegs. So when we get to 6, looking for the presence or absence of a proleg, if that proleg is absent, you need to find a gracilliarid key. Now, if you have uh, prolegs present only on A6 and A10, most times that is a geometrid, the famous and very characteristic inchworms. So here we have only on 6 and 10, and here caterpillar that wants you to be confused at which side of it is its head, but we have again only at 6 and 10. Those are the geometrids. So for 15 prime, prolegs present on other abdominal segments in addition to A6 and A10. So any other abdominal segments whatsoever with a proleg, we go to 16. Now we're going to start looking more carefully at those primary CD. If you have four CD in the presporacular group of the prothorax, this separates out pest in the family Cossidae. Now, if you're not sure what I mean exactly about the presporacular CD, stay with me. We're going to go into great detail on some of the more common examples. In most cases, there will be fewer than four CD in the presporacular group. It's very important when you're looking at CD anywhere on the organism that you are looking very carefully on both sides. Every once in a while, you'll have a little mutation that's missing a CETA on one side, but very frequently, the CETA will be worn off or broken off, and the CETAL socket where it's attached will show you where it should be, and hopefully you have one on the other side to make sure that there is a CETA there. Also, you can look very carefully at the CETAL sockets on other locations along the organism, and if the place where if the socket looks the same as a spot on the uh, preceding segment, 
that has a CETA, then that may very well be the site of a CETA and is worth counting. Here's a close-up of a prothoracic group. So as always, we have the head to the left, and I wanted to show this because these are very large characteristic CD, but still hard to see because on this organism, they are almost perfectly transparent. All right, so I'm gonna make this a little more clear, but very obviously the pre-spiracular group is in front of the spiracle. Now this can be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, but make sure you wouldn't have mistaken this almost directly above the spiracle as a pre-spiracular group. Now to make this a little more clear, there are those two CD. All right, so you see the socket for both of them very clearly, and I sort of uh, drew a dotted line around the panaculum there, but there are two CD in this presporacular group. So less than three CD, which is what we had in that case. 17 prime is if we have three CD in the presporacular group of the prothorax, as in this example there. And if you're hoping that image was larger, here we have a very excellent photograph by Jim Young with three presporacular CD on very easy to see sockets there. And here they are, one, two, and three. That takes us to a completely different group. Now, if we have two CD in the presporacular group of the prothorax, I'm gonna beat this one to death here, going into the presporacular group. So we have spiracles all along the larva that you're looking on, head to the left, this is mounted laterally. The prothorax often is a large spiracle there on the front, and we're looking right in front of that at a group of CD that will be in front of it. Many, many larvae that are plant pests have two CD in the presporacular group, as you see here. That takes us to couplet 19. Now, CD L1 and L2 of abdominal segments three to six, close together below the spiracle, often on the same panaculum, or L1 and L2 of abdominal segments three to six, widely separated. Both are below the spiracle, or one is behind the spiracle. So I'm gonna show you what that is more clearly because this is another important couplet that separates out two very large groups. So if the CD, the LCD are widely separated, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, that is the superfamily Noctuidea. Now, if they are in fact, very noticeably, L being the lateral CD, close together, and very often, if they're on the same panaculum, you have a microlep. So we have a couple couplets that separate out the Carposinidae, but the Pyraloidea are all uh, have a bicetose group below the spiracle on the abdomen. Now in the macros here, what's, what's important, important to us is, is when they are separated. separated. So, so here, here I have a uh, zoom in from LEP intercept. intercept. Also, uh, this does uh, have, a, is diagrammatic and labels each of these. So we can see that in this case, the LCD are positioned one well below and one behind the spiracle. We'll come back to that again, but I'll show another in a simplified uh, picture of a line drawing. Okay, this is Spadoptera frugiperta, and you have very obvious panaculae, but you can see that on each segment we have a panaculum directly behind and then below the spiracle, and those are the LCD. So here's the spiracle. All right, now again back to the image. There are the LCD. And something that a colleague showed me or told me in Miami that always made it easy to separate out the noctuoids is that you could draw two lines at a right angle to connect these LCD and you would make, there are the LCD, and you would make an L. So LCD arranged as an L, that's the noctuoidea. Okay, on to couplet 21, we're gonna separate out another oddball here. At least D2 and L1 of T2 and T3, the dorsal and lateral CD of the second and third thoracic segments with, a, with fleshy filaments that bear a single terminal spine. And these also have uh, the, in the subventral group at the base of the proleg on the outer side, a bicetose uh, subventral group. That is a, a group of nolids that have a pest. In most cases here, we'll be moving to 21 prime. 
where the dorsum of the larva does not have these spiny fleshy filaments. You'll just see regular CD on regular panaculae and you have a variable subventral group. Now, we're, we're going to go, go to, to some, some of the subfamilies, subfamilies in the Noctoidea here. here. 22 has to do with proleg reduction. So prolegs reduced or absent on A3 and or A4 compared to A5 and A6. These are in the uh, Noctuity and Arebidae complex. Please let's remember not to mistake these for the geometrids which separated out before. See, we have a proleg on five, but also be careful as you're counting abdominal segments because they may be widened or narrower depending on the species. So as we're counting through here though, we appear to have nothing on three and four. Whereas 22 prime is telling us that the prolegs of A3 to A6 should be all equal in size. Well, we see here, if there's anything on three and four, it is highly reduced. Here's a better example of reduction where you can actually see the prolegs there. So here, prolegs reduced or absent, again, on A3 and or A4 compared to A5 and A6. Here we have a severely reduced pair of prolegs, but still functional prolegs with crochets, and then a little larger, and these two are very similar in size. I want to note that to follow this portion of the couplet, if your mind's saying, well, they're a little smaller in the front, they're more similar. We're looking for a marked or noticeable reduction. In this case, you have a reduced proleg and then the absence of a proleg on the segment in front of it. Now, sometimes the reduced proleg will be reduced to the point of being vestigial. This particular specimen has a great pair of vestigial prolegs that we've zoomed in on this picture, and these can be very important for diagnoses. So don't automatically think that an absence is there. The reduction could be so extreme that you have something vestigial. If this hadn't darkened sitting in isopropyl alcohol, these may have been nearly invisible. I hadn't pointed out before, but it's important to remember that many of these characters, such as prolegs, will be easiest to see after you have boiled the specimen. And by that, we don't mean put the specimen in, in a pan and boil it, but put it in water that has boiled, and just drop that in for a few seconds, less than a minute, and that will not only preserve what coloration is left, or at least prevent darkening, but it'll avert some of these characters. So you may be able to see crochets or prolegs or these tiny vestigial prolegs better after. I'm beating this one to death again, but this is a very important group. And here, this shows very clearly the distinction between the geometrid having those prolegs only on 6 and 10 versus the noctuoid above that has them on 5, 6, and 10. So 22 prime is if the prolegs of A3 to A6 are all equal in size. I mentioned before to not tease yourself into thinking, well, see here, these prolegs do seem to be a little smaller than the ones behind them. All right, these subtle differences are not for a family key like this. So we are considering these to be equal in size. And over here, these very clearly everted prolegs we're considering these to be equal in size, which would take us on to 25. Now, if the CD, the ventral CD, V1, so the center of the venter, on A1 and A2 are modified into a ring-like structure, you have a particular kind of arebid. More commonly, you'll have the V1 uh, minute on A2, but a regular Ceta, okay? It will not be this ring-like structure. Most times we're going to see biordinal or uh, biserial. However, if you are at this couplet and you have clearly uniordinal, uniordinal and uniserial crochets, that will take you out to a number of uh, less common arebids and noctuids, which does include uh, some of the loopers and some larvae called the semi-loopers that are not plusiines, but more often than not, if you're here, you're going to see something like we have in this image, this biordinal crochet grouping where you clearly see 
two different rows of crochets there. And that's the Plusines. And Plusini are is a huge subfamily, of course, with many economic pests, and it has its own key within this key. Here's another image taken from the side, where we can see, especially in the background, the biordinal nature of those crochets. All right, now we're going to look closely at the cuticle. And this will separate out a group of noctuoids that have a notably spiny cuticle. Here we have a similar magnification on two late instar larvae, and this is a very smooth cuticle. And over here, we see it, that it is densely spined, especially if you look at that in comparison to the head capsule, which is showing here on the left, or the top of the um, pronotum that is here. You see these spines like densely packed rose thorns, all right, versus smooth. Now note that if it looks pebbled or bumpy, but is not spiny, that will still follow to number 27 out of couplet 25 prime. So we need to be able to go to 26, noticeable spines. Make sure you're zoomed in on very high magnification here. Now if there was a spiny cuticle, we're going to look at the arrangement now of the prothoracic CD. And this is actually a pretty simple way to separate out the very important subfamily Heliothyne by simply looking, if you have a later instar, a large larva, simply look at the arrangement of the CD in the prothoracic group. Now, if they are horizontal or a little slanted like this, that separates out the Heliothynes. It's something that you can go to immediately. In fact, if you are seeing a spiny cuticle, look at that prothoracic group. There are other organisms that have a spiny cuticle. People often make the mistake thinking that this would say, if it's a spiny cuticle, it is only that. That is not the case. Many different larvae have that. But if you've come to this key and you have a spiny cuticle and horizontally arranged presporacular group, that is very likely a noctuid. It's a heliothyne noctuid. Most of the noctuids and arebids, the noctuoids, have a vertical presporacular group. Now, if the head has a thick characteristic longitudinal band, the, there are dorsal spots on A2 that are present and obvious, and this is on pineapple from Central America. This just separates out too well and is too important and frequent to not leave here. That's Elaphria. Not as above, we're going to move on to couplet 28. Here's another difficult to understand while reading about, but easy to recognize once you've seen it character that helps us separate out some very important noctuid pests. Mesothorax and metathorax lack a minute tonal fibrillary platelet connected to the SDCD by a sclerotized bar. 28 prime reads mesothorax and metathorax with at least SD1 connected to a minute tonal fibrillary platelet by a sclerotized bar. There's a little mention here about the thickness of the bar. It's not always visible because it's an internal muscle attachment, so it may not be melanized. All right, but I'll show some images so we can get a better idea of that. But this is a very important character to learn, so we're going to go over it a bit here. So here is couplet 28, which says mesothorax and metathorax lack this structure. So all we have to do is look at these cetal bases, which are typical. It's not a big sclerotized panaculum, but we don't have any kind of special structure there beneath it. Now here is a case where that structure is present. And again, not so terribly easy to spot, but we have two cetal bases, one here and one here. And this almost has a bit of an hourglass shape. So in this case, the bar is hidden by how dark this uh, platelet is, but it almost seems as if there would be a secondary panaculum without and separate from the one above. And that's the character that we're looking at. In this case, it's on SD1 and not SD2. So there's the platelet. Now it's tricky because in this case, that's right there behind a spot, but if you were able to move the image around as I'm not, in this presentation, you would be able to see 
that's a separate structure from that spot. We'll look at another one in a moment. Now this is following where if we had only one of those. So add frontal area reaches an epicranial notch. The mandible lacks a retinaculum. The spinneret is wider than it is long. SD2 of the thoracic uh, segments 2 and 3 and SD1 of A9 are all long and hair-like and set in a dark area which re resembles a very thick cetal base. Cuticle with coarse granules, often conical and irregular in size from all over eating all kinds of things. That separates out the agrotus and feltia complex which are a great many number of pests. That seems very specific, but there are a large number in that group. However, everything else then takes us to 29 prime, another group of noctuids and arebids. Now, if we had one tonofibrillary platelet uh, on those segments, we're at couplet 30. This is a long couplet with some very important features that takes us into a very important genus. So if the head has an adfrontal area outlined with white or is, that's paler than the rest of the head capsule, forming an inverted Y, here we can only see the top legs of the Y, so it looks like an upside down V. This is very characteristic here, and you see how the line continues up here? Okay, with a mandible that has four scissorial teeth and no retinaculum on the interface, SD1 on T2 and 3 is connected to the associated tonofibrillary platelet by a minute sclerotized bar, so that character is present, but only on one of two CD. The subventral group is bicetose on A1. A lateral spot is often, but not always, present on the mesothorax or A1, such as in the previous slide, there was a dark spot there on A1, and a, or on the, on the thorax. And the body CD are short, most often not much longer than the vertical height of the spiracle on A8. A8 often has a large spiracle. That takes us to all of the spadoptera. So this is a very lengthy and careful key because we want to rule everything out that is not in this genus. And there are some tricky ones. Now 30 prime is actually simpler, but takes us to another genus. The mesothorax and metathorax here both have SD1 and SD2 connected to that little platelet by a sclerotized bar. And on this paler insect, as I'll show, the bar itself is visible. The adfrontal area of the head is often not white. You don't have that Y pattern. And the larva lacks that swollen thorax or large lateral spots. We'll go to couplet 31 with that. But I'm going to zoom in here and show really clearly these muscle attachments. The platelets on the meso and metathorax here, it looks almost like a figure eight. But importantly, sometimes you'll see a pit or bar at the base of other panaculae. But notice how this is outside and separate from that panaculum or that cetal socket. And what's happening there is this is a very strong attachment for an internal muscle, and so there is a bar inside connecting there. And this particular specimen shows those off very well. And the minute that you see that there are, those are paired on both of those segments, your mind should lead you to a question as to whether it might be a genus we're going to talk about in a moment here. Now, if you have that character, but the spinneret is characteristic in having long spines coming off of it. The spiracles are black, and it has a series of mid-dorsal spots, and sometimes a W-shaped mark on A8. That's Peridroma salsia. Of all of those characters, I really recommend looking at the spinneret, because for everything else, it will not have those. It might be spatulate or indented or otherwise smooth. So flip the specimen over and look under the head or dig out that spinneret and look at the shape. So 31 prime is another one of these not as above couplets. Now if that spinneret is rounded and has a medial depression, as is mostly the case on these larvae intercepted in Miami, the labial palpi with uh, 
will show that the last segment is much shorter than the basal segment. So look at those labial palpi. If you have a sort of stumpy final segment that will continue here with this couplet, the mature larvae uh, have paler body CD, and then young larvae often have a characteristically mottled head and dark CD. You have a little bit of proleg reduction on three and four, and this is another character here that is often seen, this lateral stripe. Even on this brown version that's fading, you see this lateral stripe. That's the infamous copatarsia. Now we're coming back to this image here. The minute that I see these muscle attachments are both on the meso and metathorax, I think, is that copatarsia? Of course, now seeing this pattern, I think it immediately am with this modeled head pattern. But if we flip that over and dig the spinneret out, it will be nice and round. Here's another picture of a couple more. It just begin to burn that um, image in. And there again are those very distinctive tonofibrillary platelets. So if the mandible and spinneret are not as above, you, the labial palpi has long segments at the end, and you have other colorations, we'll move on to 33. 33 separates out another important pest. So here we have a mandible with a large retinaculum that will be a tooth inside the tooth, okay? There will be a big, large tooth on the inner face of the mandible. The spinneret is much longer than it is wide. The last segment of the labial palpi are as long as the basal segment and the abdominal prolegs will have a lateral sclerotized plate, almost like it has armored prolegs. There are two forms of this. There's a dark form that's got a characteristic black patch around all of those abdominal spiracles on A1 to 8, and then there's also a pale form. This is probably Mamestra brassicae. Again, all of these things uh, you can reference back to the keys on LEP intercept. So for 33 prime, if no black patch surrounds the spiracles of A1 to 8, or no thick white spiracular stripe from the head to the anal prolegs is present, or you do see this coloration, but the mouth parts are not as above, it's worldwide on any host, any different group of things, this is another noctuid. We have a lot of noctuids, and of course, far too many to separate out with this key. 34 separates out another large group of micros. This comes from if you had seen the lateral CD together or on the same panaculum. And 34 is if we have D2 of A9 on separate panaculi, or each dorsal CETA of D2 is closer to the D1 than to the other. D1 and SD1 of A9 are not joined on the same panaculum. SD1 on A9 is sometimes and often hair-like. The anal comb is absent or if present, the teeth are straight or curved. That separates out another group. Now, the gelichioids are separated. A group of them is separated with this uh, submentum with a large pit. Now, if the submentum lacks a large oval pit, a 1 to 8 lacks a sclerotized ring around SD1, and you have that from various sources on various hosts. We move on. If L1 and L2 of A1 to 8 are closely spaced and on the same panaculum, we do have a couple of macro families in this case. The Cossides and the Cisseid, there are the lateral CD together on a plate but mostly that separates out a great number of microlepidoptera. And if you're still with us and you're move, you've moved as far as 36 prime, everything else that would key there is a micro and not a macrolepidoptera, so we would use another key. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? When is it important to boil preserved larvae? Good question. It's always important to boil preserved larvae. The disadvantage with boiling larvae is that you may lose some color patterns. So if, you, if it's very important to keep coloration, I recommend taking pictures of a freshly preserved or freshly dead or even live larva right away. But boiling will prevent further degradation of the colors, especially if it is preserved in isopropyl alcohol. 
never send a specimen to a specialist which has not been previously boiled.